Hello, today we're going to talk about um, metallurgy as it relates to welding. Um, so this is a huge subject. Um, people spend entire careers studying metallurgy or metallurgy, if you prefer the incorrect pronunciation. Um, we're going to scratch the surface of it. We're going to try to cover the, the metallurgy information you need to know as a welder to be successful and put you ahead of a lot of the other people. Um, this subject is one of my hobbies. I really enjoy the entire topic. So you're going to have questions, come and find me, I'll answer them the best I can. But um, it's a really cool subject and uh, the more you dig, the more you learn, the more you realize there's tons of stuff you don't know. So um, we'll get started. First thing before we, before we talk about actual metallurgy, let's talk about heat versus temperature. Um, this is just kind of a base understanding we need when we're talking about heat and temperature as it relates to welding. So heat is a measure of heat input, a measure of, of energy, thermal heat and thermal energy and matter. Um, in the welding world we usually use joules for that. So let's say I took a block of steel, got my torch out, heated it up, and I, I put 20,000 joules into this, piece of, into this piece of steel. That's heat. I put 20,000 joules in it. It's going, to, it's going to lose that heat through um, conduction if it's sitting on something that's conducting heat away from it, just through the air. It's going to lose that heat eventually. But that's heat. So temperature is... Um, a measurement of thermal activity, or not thermal activity, um, a measure of, yeah, thermal activity, like, like atomic activity on a surface. Um, if I put 20,000 joules in, this whole thing is not the same temperature, okay? The top of it up here is going to be, let's say it's going to be 1,000 degrees. This corner down here is not. Let's say it's only 500. So I've got the same amount of heat. This block took 20,000 joules of heat, but temperature is not the same. Temperature is um, a measurement of the vibrating speed or frequency of atoms, and that's what, bur what burns you. Um, and the more excited they are, the different color they change. Um, that's why stuff that's really hot is almost white because those atoms are, the temperature of those atoms is super high and it is bouncing around like crazy. Um, there, there's a, a range of colors in there. You know, it goes from the normal gray to kind of a dull red to an orange to a yellow and then to white. That is temperature. Um, but I still put 20,000 joules in there. The only reason I want to get this out of the way is because we as welders and as humans are really bad about um, using these terms interchangeably, and they're not. They're, they're very different terms in the world of science, and we need to understand that. Um, you know, when you preheat the oven, you're putting joules of energy into that oven to get it hot. When you pull something out of it, you're checking temperature of the, of the meat. You're putting joules into that meat. You're putting heat into that meat your steak, but then we're going to, to check the temperature of it to see what we've got, if we want to medium rare or, or well done or whatever. So anyway, heat versus temperature, that's important. So the other stuff we're going to talk about, we're going to talk about um, grain structure from the result from the manufacturing process of whatever we're, we're working on. We're going to talk about crystalline structures of different materials and why they matter. We're going to talk about properties of materials, hardness, strength, ductility, all that kind of stuff. Heat affected zones in welding, heat treatment in welding, and then causes of corrosion in stainless steel. So this might end up being two or three parts. So grain structure for manufacturing. So steel is made in different ways. Um, the biggest ways for us are rolling, casting, and forging. Um, rolling is usually plate and structural shapes like beam.
Castings are all kinds of stuff. Uh, lots of stuff gets cast. Um, and casting is pouring molten metal in, in, into a shape. We, we make it whatever shape we want. Um, lots of stuff. Usually not very strong. Castings, if they have to take a lot of uh, abuse or weight, um, they make up for their lack of strength and mass. They, they cast them real big. And then forging, bringing pressure. Um, and forgings are really good. Forgings are tools, um, gears, stuff that's going to take load, it's going to take impact, it needs to be tough, it needs to be workable. So we weld on all this stuff. Uh, roll shapes are the most common, castings are real common too. Forgings, we try not to weld on forgings, and we'll talk about that in just a minute. So let's talk about rolled grain structure. So because rolled shapes are rolled, um, their grain structure gets real long. What happens is they take a, a big piece of steel and they run it through smaller and smaller sets of rolls for making plate and every time it goes through it necks down until we end up with whatever thickness of material we want. So this, this thing started off as a foot thick and it ends up being a quarter inch thick. What that happens, if we look at that piece of plate from the side, we get these really long grains like wood. We take all the small grains that were in the big block and as we roll them out, they get longer and finer. And we end up with a very wood-like grain structure from a rolled shape. Now that that means some stuff. One thing is, just like wood, it is very strong if we try to pull it that way. Because we're, we're trying to stretch those grains, it doesn't work very well. It's also real strong if we're trying to compress it this way. This is compressive strength, or co compressive load we're trying to push together. This is tensile load we're trying to pull it apart. They're both very strong with rolled shapes. Um, the problem with rolled shapes is, I'm going to blow this up a little bit, you get all of these these long grains in here. If I'm going to use this, if I'm going to put this under load that's not on the axis of the grain, so let's say I'm going to um, weld a lifting eye to this, and I'm going to pull it that way, it's going to try to separate these grains. It's not strong in this direction, okay? Because the way the grains are, just like wood. Two by fours aren't strong laying on their side. They're real strong either being compressed or being pulled. Um, rolled shapes the same way, so we need to be careful of that. Castings, they end up without a real grain structure at all. They end up with what's called a, an omnidirectional grain structure, or a, un well, I won't say that. That's more of a forging, but castings, so I've got a big cast block here the grains are going going every which way. They're just, there's no rhyme or reason to them. They're different shapes, they're different sizes. Um, they're not, it's not a homogenous material at all. Um, like I said, castings, if they want strength out of a casting, they do it through mass, they make them real heavy, they make them overly big. Um, but we can weld on castings, they work, it welds great. And we don't really do anything to the grain structure because it's pretty crappy when we get there, we don't hurt it any much, very much. They do make some very high strength castings. Um, I, I run into some of them in the rail industry that is not cheese grade garbage like this. Um, it, it's really high quality stuff and you don't run into it very often. And um, it's the, the, the way they make it is so clean and controlled that it ends up being very high strength castings. Um, forgings have, are the ones with the omnidirectional grain structure. So if I've got a, say it's a forged gear, terrible, terrible picture of a gear, um, that grain structure is very uniform and it also goes, it goes in all directions throughout the part, but the pressure, as it was hot, as they form this gear, so they, you know, they put a piece of steel in a die and they, they smash it with a hammer, it makes the grain structure much more uniform. 
makes it very, very strong and tough. That's forgings are very good things. The problem is, is sometimes we're asked to weld on forgings. So let's say I break two of these teeth off this gear and I've got to weld them back on. So when I weld these two gears back on, my grain structure right here is going to change because I have heated it up to its critical temperature and then let it cool down again. And that might end up being grain structure like that. Let me see if I can enhance a little bit. So what that ha what happens here is we've got we have a transition. We have a transition from one grain structure to another, and that is going to be the weak point of this part. When this thing fails, it's going to fail right at that interface between those two grain structures. So if at all possible, we don't want to weld on forgings because all we're going to do is make them worse. Sometimes you have to, and you know I've repaired forged parts and they they work great for a long long time, um, but you're taking chances when you do it. Let's just leave it at that. that. Um, so let's talk about crystalline structures of metal. There are two basic crystalline structures of metal. There is um, FCC, which is face centered cubic. And there is BCC body centered cubic. So face center cubic is pretty much just a box. It's atoms arranged in box-like shapes. Um, they're just boxes. Body center cubic is different. Body center cubic has the same corner points but they've got a center node that everything comes off of. So every one of these corners has connections that go into the center point right here. Um, these are shaped, nobody knows what jacks are anymore, but the game people used to play, and it was, it was old even when I was a kid, jacks where they've, they've kind of got these cross sections like that. That's a lot more like what a body center cubic um, shape looks like. And the shapes of these crystals play a huge role in how these, these, these materials behave. Um, face center cubic stuff, I like to imagine it, say I've just got rows and rows of boxes stacked up. Okay, if I come up here and push on that box, this whole row is going to shift really easily because they're just boxes sliding, sliding on top of each other, just boxes. Body center cubic is not that way. Um, instead of square boxes, I've got stuff that interlocks. And this is a, a poor drawing of what that looks like, but I've got, I've got interlocks happening. So I can't just come up here and push on that and move it. They're, they're going to lock together, right? They're going to, they're going to lock together and they're not going to want to move. So knowing that, what materials represent these two groups? Well, face center cubic, the stuff that's really easily moved, it's stuff that's really easily moved. It's gonna be aluminum, it's gonna be um, copper, it's gonna be gold. And we know what the uh, um, periodic table abbreviation for gold is, AU. It's stuff that's really, that's really soft. I can come up to aluminum with a hammer, cold, smash it, and flatten it out. Um, I really can't do that to stuff that's body center cubic. Body center cubic is going to be steel, um, tungsten, stuff like that. Stuff that is not easily moved at room temperature. So, something really interesting happens though. If I take a piece of steel, so I take a piece of steel, and I heat it up right here. I can just take my bare hand and bend it, right? If I heat up this area right here, I can just take my hand and bend it, right? Well, why is that? Why does heat change this? Because here's the, here's the deal, and this is what's really cool about metallurgy, is at the critical temperature of steel, or, or which is about 
1450 degrees, steel goes from being body center cubic to face center cubic, and all of a sudden we can move it. As soon as it drops down through that range and gets, it transfers back to body center cubic, it becomes rigid again. So steel's really cool that way. The other thing that happens when it goes through that phase change is it, it loses its magnet, is magnetism. So a real good way to check if you're at this critical temperature is a magnet will not stick to steel past its transformation temperature where it's face center cubic and, and movable. Uh, people that make knives do heat treating, they use that all the time. They've got something in the forge, they're checking it with a magnet, and as soon as the magnet stops sticking to it, they know they're at that critical temperature and they quench, because that's when we want to quench is, is at that transition phase. So those are the, the common crystalline structures. Um, there's one more, which is hex, hex, hexagonal close packed. Uh, we'll talk about that next year. It really doesn't apply to welding. Uh, this is the only stuff that applies to welding for right now. Okay. Um, I'm going to stop here, and I'll start another video in a minute. We're going to talk about properties of metal. Talk about properties of metal.